This history video is for Year 13 history students at Saul Points Community College who are studying the Kaiser to Führer unit. And this unit looks at the Reichstag between 1900 and 1914 and some of the main political parties and political pressure groups. Within the Reichstag itself there were a number of political parties uh, going from left wing to right wing. They are the Social Democrat Party the German Free Thought Party, sometimes known as the Left Liberals, the Centre Party, Liberal Progressives, National Liberals, Free Conservatives and Conservatives. We look at each of those parties in turn and what they stand for and also some of their key members. Let's start with the Social Democrat Party over on the left, who really represented the working class. It was a split party. Some were Marxists, um, looking for something much closer to communism, and were led firstly by August Babel, who argued for revolution and non-cooperation within the political system. And he was supported by key figures Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, more of them later. There were reformers um, within the Social Democrat Party, led by Eduard Bernstein, who argued that the party should work within the political system to avoid social reform. They grew during this period, and the number of seats they gained in the Reichstag grew each election. In 1898, they had 82 seats. Um, by 1912, they were up to 110. Between 1878 and 1890, Bismarck had passed anti-socialist laws which had banned all socialist groups and meetings. So the SDP were always very careful. They knew they had to tread cautiously or those kind of laws could be reintroduced. But industrialisation and urbanisation had greatly increased the working class's appetite for political action. By 1914, two and a half million Germans were members of trade unions and 400,000 went on strike at some point during 1913. In 1910, the SDP had 720,000 members, making them the largest social political party in Europe. And the 1912 elections made them the strongest party in the Reichstag. So a growing force. The German Free Thought Party of the left liberals formed in 1884 as a breakaway from the national liberals. They attracted support from progressive intellectuals and certain elements of the commercial and professional middle classes. It split again in 1893 into three factions and was reunited in 1910 under the new name of the FVP, the Progressive People's Party. The Centre Party represented the Catholic Church largely based in the south and got some support from non-socialist working class but also from the middle and lower middle classes. They feared the rise of socialism but were also anti-Prussian and their number of seats in the Reichstag stays pretty much the same. In 1898 they had 102, by 1912 it dropped a little bit to 91. The liberal progressives represented the middle classes they were in favour of the development of parliamentary government and were not that keen on the idea of a nation state and nationalism. Again, the number of seats they get in the Reichstag stays the same. It's relatively low. In 1898 they had 41, by 1912 up to 42. The National Liberals represented the industrial middle class and the Protestant middle class. They did believe in the idea of a strong nation state. They were keen to develop, to develop the state, but with a liberal constitution. They did, however, support attacks on Catholics. By 1912, they had 45 seats in the Reichstag. The Free Conservatives represented the commercial, industrial and wealthier professional classes across Germany. They were strong supporters of Bismarck and the ideas of protectionism, and believed that the state should support German businesses with tariffs. They were dropping a little in popularity. By 1912, they had 14 seats in the Reichstag. The Conservatives represented the Junkers, the landed interests and especially those in Prussia. They supported the Kaiser, discipline and authority and were in favour of a nationalist foreign policy. By 1912, they had 43 seats in the Reichstag, but that was down. In 1907, they'd had up, they were up to 60. 
On most issues, the Kaiser and his governments could nearly always rely on the backing of the right-wing parties, the Conservatives, the Free Conservatives and the National Liberals. However, the voting strength of these parties was in decline. In 1887, they had gained 48% of the popular vote and 55% of the seats in the Reichstag. By 1912, their share of the popular vote was down to 26% and 26% of the Reichstag seats. As a result, the political stance taken by the more centre parties, the left liberals, the centre party and the social democrats, became increasingly important. The left liberals thought support were mainly supportive of the government at times, but could be more critical. The same couldn't be said of the centre party. They consistently won between 90 and 110 seats and were the largest single party in the Reichstag. They represented a wide spectrum of socio-political views, but they did enjoy a pivotal role in German politics. They couldn't be taken for granted, and the imperial government ignored their views at its peril. Perhaps even more significant, though, was the meteoric rise of the Social Democrats, who'd organised themselves into a nationwide mass party. In 1891, they'd adopted an uncompromising Marxist programme to overthrow the Wilhelm class system. It was a popular manifesto. In 1887, they gained 10% of the vote and 2.8% of the seats. By 1912, 34.8% of the vote, 27.7% of the seats. As I've already said, though, there were very clear divisions within its, within its own ranks about how to achieve its aims. Some of its members, particularly the trade unionists, believed in a policy of gradualism or reformism. Basic parliamentary reforms and living and working conditions which would represent practical progress towards improving the lot of working people. This was in opposition to the views of the hardline or more extreme traditional Marxists because these views involved cooperating and compromising with the ruling class. The traditionalists wanted a revolutionary uprising which would overthrow the wealthy. This division weakened the Social Democrats. In theory, they were committed to a revolutionary transformation of society. In practice, they were content to talk the rhetoric of revolution whilst working for social and political change through the existing system. To their opponents, the Social Democrats were seen as a force for evil, which must be isolated, controlled and probably destroyed. The balance of political forces in the Wilhelmine Reichstag was crucial to Germany's political and constitutional problems at the start of the 20th century. The Reichstag itself was polarised between those who wished to see no change in the existing order and those who wished the creation of a genuine parliamentary democracy. One group of historians are known as the Structuralist Group. And they emerged in the mid-1960s and they sought to explain history through a detailed examination and synthesis of social, political and economic forces. Foremost in this group, was the historian H.U. Wieler. Wieler scoffed at the idea of Kaiser Wilhelm II as a dominant influence in the direction of policy and political affairs in Germany. According to him, the Kaiser had neither the ability nor the strength of character to have much of an impact. Instead, they developed a power vacuum after 1890, which created a permanent crisis of the state behind a facade of high-handed leadership. Those are Vela's words, not mine. Other forces were able to emerge and to exert a dominating influence over the nation's affairs. These other forces included Prussia's traditional elites, the landowning junkers, the officer class of the army, the professional body of administrative bureaucrats, the judiciary and officials of the, of the diplomatic corps. The imperial constitution had deliberately allowed for the domination of Prussia over Germany's other states. Although Germany was in the process of rapid change and new social forces were emerging, most notably an economically powerful entrepreneurial middle class and a class-conscious workers' movement. It was the desire of the traditional elites to maintain their power against what was seen as the threat of genuine mass democracy which prompted them to seek an alliance the newly emerging elites of industry and commerce by offering them a stake in the system. That stake was to give them uh, armaments contracts and colonial markets overseas. 
The bringing together of all of these dominant social elites into one force was known as Sam Lung's politic, the policy of concentration. It disregarded the forces of democracy and socialism and portrayed them as unpatriotic enemies of the German Reich. In Weyler's view, Germany's decision in the 1890s to undertake Weltpolitik, a world policy, was no more than social imperialism an attempt to hold up the position of the elites at the top of Germany's class system by diverting the masses' attention, taking them away from social and political reform and towards a popular acceptance of the Kaiser and the Kaiser Reich. This viewpoint explains the, the presence of so many pressure groups, and a lot of these pressure groups are pushing for nationalist, imperialistic means and trying to get people excited about the idea of Germany as a major world power. Some of these pressure groups were looking to promote German colonial expansion. So you've got the German, German Colonial League set up in 1882, which pushed for the acquisition of more German colonies. The Pan-German League, founded in 1890, which wanted to see German dominance in Europe and in colonies. The Navy League, and the German Society for the Eastern Marches. We also had economic pressure groups, groups like the Central Association of German Industrialists, which was designed to protect industrial interests, the Agrarian League, led by Junkers, and the Imperial German Mittelstand Confederation, which aimed to preserve traditional German values. We also got political pressure groups, so you've got working class trade unions, you've got Catholic groups, you've got youth organisations as well. In addition to the structuralists, you've also got historians who emphasise the need to look at history from below. So rather than looking at big organisations and structures, look at what's happening with ordinary people on the streets and at a local level. And that helps you to organise, recognise sort of the importance of popular movements in Germany at the beginning of the 20th century. What we need to remember is that the Kaiserreich is a state of many regions with very different political and cultural traditions. And one interpretation could be that Germany's political leaders aren't manipulating those factions and those groups. Actually, they're responding to them. And because they've got no real power and sense of purpose, they're responding to whichever pressure group shouts the loudest at that particular time. Thank you very much for listening. Do watch this video alongside your own notes and use them to add in more detail. Thank you very much for watching.